Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Queen's Medical Center. My name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Corporate Communications here at the Queen's Health Systems. And on behalf of us, I'd like to welcome you this evening. Our lecture this evening, the discussion is going to be about an issue that affects one in 25 adults every year in the United States, and that is difficulty in swallowing. Tonight's lecture is called The Trouble with Swallowing Causes, Risks, and Treatment Options. At this time, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to our main speaker this evening, Joanne Kawahigashi Oshiro. Please join me in giving her a warm round of applause. She is a speech language swallowing pathologist here at the Queen's Medical Center. And when I saw her background, it just spoke to me because it said, how, to me, how meaningful are words and speech to our speaker, to Joanne? Well, she got her Bachelor's of Arts at the University of Hawaii in English literature and speech with honors. Then she continued on at UH and got her Master's of Science degree in speech pathology and audiology, which is now known as communication sciences and disorders. She has been a practicing speech language swallowing pathologist for 30 years. And her experience includes working with patients who have communication and swallowing disorders. She's helped those affected with neurologic disorders, voice disorders, and head and neck cancer. She has served in acute and skilled care facilities, rehabilitation hospitals, and in the home setting as well. She was an instructor and clinical supervisor at the University of Hawaii's Communication Sciences and Disorders Department for more than 10 years. And that's where she taught and supervised graduate students at the UH Speech and Hearing Clinic. Last year, she returned to the department as adjunct faculty, and I was meeting some people outside earlier. We have some of her students here in the audience this evening. Oh, look, there they are. Yay. Uh, she is also, okay, I'm going to say this, go Cougars. She is a proud graduate of, oh, you guys are awesome, Kaiser High School. So let's give a warm round of applause for Joanne Kawahigashi Oshiro. Welcome, Lisa, you didn't tell me my pores were going to be that big across the wide screen. All right, so the trouble with swallowing. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start with disclosures. There are none. There's nothing I have with anyone at this point. Um, the objectives are to understand the normal and impaired swallowing process, familiarities with the signs and the symptoms of swallowing problems, swallow testing, and managing impaired swallow. All right, so the good thing about swallowing is we don't have to think about it for a long time. We can do a lot of things while we're swallowing, but the trouble with swallowing is when we have to start to think about it, when we end up having difficulty. It can be very scary to us and the people around us. So now swallowing, according to Wikipedia, which is our main um, source of information these days, it's the process of human or body, animal body that makes something pass from the mouth into the pharynx or the throat into the esophagus while shutting the epiglottis. What is that? We'll talk about that. And it's a, an important, swallowing is an important part of eating and drinking. So the normal swallow, here we go. That involves, um, it's made up of three phases, the mouth, which is the lips, teeth, tongue, roof of mouth, all of that. Um, the pharyngeal phase, which is the um, throat and the upper valve, and then the esophageal phase, which is the food pipe. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that. There's the mouth, if you can see that where the tongue is, throat or the pharyngeal area, and then the esophagus and the food pipe. So we're going to try to show the normal swallow function. <laughs> there we go. All right, so this is what normal swallowing looks like. Food enters the mouth. You can see that big fan thing. That's your tongue. Um, the triangular thing that flips over, that's what they call your epiglottis. It's like a little trap door that covers over your airway every time you swallow. Now, the part that looks like a ladder, that's your airway. That's, that goes to your lungs. And where the food is going right now is down the food pipe or your esophagus. So that's normal, the normal swallow. Oopsie, can you see it? Is it on? Oh, yeah, it is. It was. All right. That was the normal swallow in action. Now we're going to look at the impaired swallow. OK. 
Okay, here we go. So now this, if you notice, this time, instead of all the food and the liquid going down the back pipe, which is against the, the back of the neck, it's coming down the front. So that's what we call aspiration or when you take something into your lungs. Everybody notice the difference? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now dysphagia, that's the fancy word for swallowing problems. So dys meaning difficulty, phagia meaning eat or swallow, and that's in Greek. So you might hear the word dysphagia, dysphagia, that's what it's about. So now who has swallowing problems? Whoops. So who? More common among older folks, as high as 22% in people over 50. So now what they're finding though, besides having a problem, they're finding, or they, meaning the researchers, are finding that swallowing difficulty starts as early as in our 50s. At first they thought it was 60s and 70s, now they're finding it by 50s, inside starts to change. Now as high as 30% of the elderly population that are inpatient may have some swallowing issues, 68% of elderly folks in long-term care facilities. So what it's saying is that the older we get, generally the more problems we have because of the system changing and th things happening to the system. Now is dysphagia a problem? Yeah, it can lead to many problems. Uh, one major one would be health, a health complication called pneumonia. About The studies show that a third of patients with swallowing problems can develop pneumonia, and 60,000 people a year die from such health complications. Oops, I'm a little too vigorous with this. But swallowing problems besides just the... The medical issues, there also can be some problems that lead to social isolation and depression. So if you can't eat with people, you can't be in with the, the holiday parties, you're by yourself, you're coughing, choking, don't want to be around people, it can really be um, an isolating situation which can lead to depression. So what kind of swallowing problems are there? Couple types, well, a lot, but two main types would be progressive swallowing problems and sudden onset swallowing problems. So what happens when that happens? Well, sometimes the structure changes all of a sudden or over time, or sometimes, or and, sometimes the person's ability to control those structures changes. So some sudden onset swallowing problems, now this not, is not an exhaustive list, it's just some, could be things as stroke or spinal cord injury, and what happens in that case is there's muscle weakness or discoordination that can affect how easily somebody swallows, and sometimes things can get misdirected down the windpipe instead of the food pipe. With intubation or when they have to put a trach or something to help you breathe, um, the breathing tube in your throat can restrict how your throat moves, which can affect how things go down it. Traumatic brain injury as well. If it happens one time, brain swelling can affect the ability to, uh, to control swallowing muscles. Some progressive ones that happen over a long period of time could be related to Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, head and neck cancer, that uh, things change slowly. Um, some developmental delays as you get older, things uh, may be changing as well. And sometimes uh, even reflux, if you have um, some gastroesophageal disorders, reflux can affect your swallow as well. So now when the person changes, sometimes level of alertness and wakefulness changes. So they are not awake and alert enough to eat safely. Sometimes level of cognition or thinking changes. Sometimes after a stroke, they're not the same person. Or after a brain injury, they're not quite the same person. They're just eating and shoveling. And it's like, where did that come from? Or, or it's not necessarily fast, but it's constant. They're not even chewing. All right, and level of pain. Sometimes when you're in too much pain, you don't want to eat. That's the last thing. Or if you're nauseated, you don't want to be eating. So different things can affect your swallowing as well. Now, how do I know if I have a swallowing problem? Some signs of dysphagia. So some of these could include drooling or difficulty with mouth control. If you can't control what your mouth makes and saliva, it's going to be hard, hard to control what food and liquid come in from outside. If there's food or liquid left in your mouth after you swallow, sometimes you're not gathering and propelling everything back one time like we would do when we were younger or stronger. If we have trouble keeping lips closed when eating and food is falling out of the mouth, that's another sign. If things are leaking from your nose, 
if you eat it, when you eat and drink. If you feel food stuck in your throat up here or sometimes down in here, that could be a swallowing issue as well. Um, some pain or discomfort when you swallow, it hurts. Or I use a lot of oh, effort when I push down. It feels like I gotta push really hard. Or if you have a wet or gurgly voice after you eat or drink, sounds like a drain pipe or that you're talking almost underwater. More signs can include coughing or choking during or after eating and drinking, difficulty coordinating your swallowing and your breathing. Sometimes people will swallow and then try to breathe in at the same time and then, then you notice things like that kind of behavior. Um, you can have aspiration pneumonia. We'll talk about what that is. Respiratory infections and fevers again and again, either low-grade fevers or temperature spikes sometimes. Um, if you need extra time to chew and swallow, changes in eating habits, you're avoiding certain things. I can eat everything, but you know what? I, I just stay away from rice or I can't drink water. I cough all the time, so I'm just drinking a lot of juice. Okay. Um, weight loss or dehydration from not being able to or not wanting to eat enough. So when it gets hard or scary, we tend to avoid doing it. Now keep in mind, some swallowing problems may be temporary. Like we said with intubation, if you have a tube in your throat that holds it down when you try to swallow, it can be difficult, but once they take it out, things can get better. You can have medication side effects. Sometimes you have dry mouth, so I can't quite swallow things as easily as I used to, but I change my meds, I'm okay. Um, or sometimes there's an interaction between medications. That's why just don't start adding all kind of stuff. You gotta talk with your doctor and make sure he or she knows what meds you're taking, or your pharmacist. Sometimes if you're tired, fatigued, um, if you have any kind of swelling anywhere, that'll, that will affect, can affect your swallowing, but it may not be for forever, depending on what causes it. We must, though, consider the whole picture rather than relying on just one sign or symptom. So now, the big questions, what are they? Well, what, what is aspiration? A lot of people know that term. What is pneumonia? And what is aspiration pneumonia? So aspiration, in this sense, is not the, the better of the two definitions. So this one is foreign contents in the lungs. So nothing should be in your lungs but air, hopefully, and not a denture. Like one of my patients in the nursing home said one time, He's like, they did, they did a chest x-ray and they saw something in there and then when they pulled it out, it was my denture. All right, we don't want that. What is pneumonia? That's a lung infection or inflammation. Do they go hand in hand? We'll talk about that too. And, and then there's something called aspiration pneumonitis. So that's chemical contents into the lungs, and that could include vomit or reflux, okay? So something coming up and then going down the wrong pipe. So instead of something going down the wrong pipe from top down, it's bottom up and in. And that can cause infection or inflammation. And what's dangerous about that is that it, the acid is corrosive. So you can do a lot of lung damage that way. Now, what are some signs or symptoms of aspiration? Things in my lungs. All right, chest pain when breathing or coughing. Confusion or changes in mental awareness in adults 65 or older. A cough, which may produce phlegm, colored phlegm, and fatigue. If they just look sick, they look tired. If there's fever, sweating, shaking, chills, shaking chills or shaking and chills, lower than normal body temperature in adults older than 65 and people with weak immune systems or temperature spikes and low-grade fever because the body's trying to fight an infection. So you're going to look sick. If you have nausea, vomiting or diarrhea and shortness of breath. So now, does dysphagia or swallowing problems plus aspiration, taking things into your lungs, always equal pneumonia, a lung infection? Not always. Now the usual suspects we need to consider is number one, the quality and consistency of mouth care. Okay, that this must include cleaning the teeth, gum, tongue, everything. Okay, roof of mouth, side, cheeks, everything if you want. And you need to do that, hopefully, before the first meal of the day. Um, you have to consider feeding ability. Can the person feed himself, herself? Is help needed? How much, how fast is somebody feeding and in what position? Are you standing above? Are you sitting eye to eye? 
um, and if there is dysphagia, if there is a swallowing problem. So how many signs, how many symptoms are you having and how bad are they? So it's a combination of things that can lead you down the bad path. And we must also consider the person's ability to follow directions and his or her energy level. So how will you test my swallowing, you're asking? Well, when you come into the clinic, we'll, um, we'll take a good and a thorough case history. We've got to find out what's going on. When do, you, when do you have problems? When did it start? What happens? We'll do what we call an oral mechanism or uh, examination. So we've got to look at how things work. Strength, speed, coordination, range, how fast things move, how, how much they move. And then we're going to check your swallow with liquids and solids because we've got to see what's going on. So if you come to Queens, we'll check you with thin liquids. So that stuff is thin as water. We'll check you with nectar thick liquids like Kern's nectar, a little bit slower moving and thicker. Um, stuff that may be as thick as honey, and you might have seen some of that out front with one of our inpatient speech language pathologists, Kim. So she had some out there for people to try. Eh, and we'll sometimes, but rarely, we check people um, swallowing with things as thick as pudding. And I know you're all wondering, gosh, is that for me in the future? Not necessarily. All right, so the food consistencies, we have to check how you eat too, not just swallow liquids, but how you eat. So regular stuff, whole pieces, big pieces of stuff, chopped up is uh, the ch cut up cubed pieces, minced would be finely chopped, size of rice grains, and puree, stuff like baby food. And we got to see how you do. But you're asking, how can you tell what's going on inside? Good question. So there are a couple of instrumental swallow tests that we can do. One is called a modified, the modified barium swallow test. So now what that is involved, or what is involved with that, excuse me, is, well, it's also known as the video fluoroscopic swallow study. So it goes by a lot of different names. So this test is done under x-ray with a speech language pathologist and radiologist. Um, what you're going to do is eat and drink, just like during the clinical evaluation. And at the time, we're going to use some strategies if we need to, positioning your head differently, making you do different things to increase your swallow safety and your comfort. So let me see if I can call that up. Um, hang on. Now, this is what we look like. Oh, here we go. Inside the body, just like the other pictures that you saw, but this is a real x-ray. That's happening now. Hopefully, you can see your your landmarks. That little curly thing. That's that little trapdoor that's over your airway, and it drops over the airway when you swallow. And let me. We're, we're going to run that. And here's the swallow. Yoop, yoop, just like that. So this is the normal swallow. If you notice, all the food, which is the dark stuff, it's colored with barium, goes down towards the back part of uh, the throat area. Let's look at it again because that's neat to see. All right, that's one type of evaluation. Another uh, instrumental swallow test we do is called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, or FEES. So now what's involved with the FEES is that we use a small tube with a camera and a light on the end of it. That's called an endoscope. Now this is the important part. The endoscope is inserted gently through the nose, not up the nose, but through the nose. There's a big difference and into the throat. Okay, and then from there, the camera displays a clear view of what's going on inside of the throat on the computer screen. And then, you, you, believe it or not, you eat and you drink when the camera is in there, and then we can see where things go. Um, I don't have a, a video of that, but this is the endoscope. Now, keep in mind, the whole thing doesn't need to go through your nose. Just a little bitty bit. And I've, I've had it done to me. We've had to do it to each other. And what it feels like is just like when you get water in your nose at the beach. It just, just like that, that's all. And nobody gags with it in because it doesn't even go in your mouth. All right. So we do the test. There's a problem. Now what? There are some treatment options. Um, and they involve several things. But at one time, everybody thinks, oh, my goodness, you're just going to take food away from me. Or you're going to thicken everything up, and i got to eat baby food. And that's a fear of, of some folks. So diet modifications, there are some times we do that for some certain reasons, and we'll explain some, I will explain some of that. There are some swallowing strategies or things that you can do while you eat to help you eat and drink more safely. Um, there's 
how you sit and what you do makes a difference. And there's some exercises that you can actually do to strengthen up the swallowing uh, muscles. Because swallowing is all muscle, um, or a lot of it is muscle, structure as well. But movement, swallowing is movement. And at one time, I think people feared, as I said before, swallowing therapy only had to do with you're going to take away certain foods from me. But the push now is trying to rehabilitate the swallow, get it stronger, so get you back on regular foods and regular liquids, meaning I don't need to put the powder inside anymore. I'm not doomed to that forever. Okay, so we want to be a little more progressive about that. Uh, as far as diet consistency recommendations or how big the pieces should be, how soft, how, you know, how wet, how moist, we have the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And standardization is spelt that way. It's European or something like that. So there's no Z, but that's what it looks like. And so this is kind of what, don't get too hung up on it, but what it's showing you is the different types of consistencies or textures that we can, to modify your food so that it's easier and safer for people to eat. So there's what we call a, up at the top of that inverted upside down pyramid is regular foods, chicken, meat, big things like that. Then we have soft bite sized, which may be cubed. We have minced and moist, pureed, which is the blended foods. Um, and then some extremely thick things and liquidized, so it's just like soups and everything. So it just depends. And then on the liquids, we have extremely thick, moderately thick, mildly, th all this th different gradations of thickness. All right, so why do we use thick liquids? Um, as we were talking with some of the folks up front, we use thicker liquids for some folks because it's just easier for them to gather and swallow rather than having things rush too quickly back down the throat and then they end up coughing and choking because everything quite didn't get in place at the right time for you to swallow it safely. Other diet modifications might include saying, you know, you may have to stay away from certain stuff. If that aggravates your stomach, that can aggravate everything all the way up the food pipe, which includes the throat area. Sometimes you got to watch your caffeine and fatty foods and things like that because, again, if you have reflux, that can also affect your swallowing as well. So body positioning, there's some things we can do with what you do when you eat that will make you more comfortable and can keep you safer when you swallow. So body positioning helps to redirect the movement of the food and the liquid in the mouth and the throat, and it can help to change the throat dimensions. So for example, um, sit upright with good posture when you eat and drink. So you can see, you want to sit upright because you want to keep the pipe everything nice and smooth and in line, everything goes down easily. Have good form, just like your physical therapist will tell you, just like you used to tell your kids, have good form. It, it's better on your digestion anyway. Now, I got these pictures from YouTube, so they're not the best, but they will teach us a little bit or at, like, let us see some things. So you might have heard of putting the chin slightly down when you eat or when you drink. That's called a chin tuck. And that helps to narrow, one thing that it does is help to narrow the airway opening. Now, this is a picture of when you drink, you can kind of slightly tuck your chin this way. Um, that's something generally that we, we may or may not recommend depending, but sometimes people have heard of that. Now, we don't necessarily tell you put your whole head down like that. Um, again, this is YouTube and this is what we found, what I found. But it's just, sometimes just a little bit of an adjustment makes the world of difference. Now there are, besides body positioning, there are strategies or things you can do when you eat that may help you swallow more safely. So now these are used to change the timing or the strength of particular movements of swallowing. So for example, uh, we're good, we tell people, it sounds kind of obvious, but sometimes we don't do it, is swallow with good form, swallow very strongly. All right, so everybody just swallow and, or just imagine you're gonna swallow a ping pong ball. All right, everybody swallow, imagine swallowing a ping pong ball. Boom. Okay, it requires some effort, right? So it's good form, and that's something we don't always do, you know? So I know sometimes we walk with good form, all right, or, or we don't. Okay, so same thing. You can swallow with good form, or you don't. So have good habits now, use good form. Um, other things we do, sometimes we tell people, I want you to swallow, cough, <coughs> and then swallow again. Because sometimes a little bit of liquid or something leaks into the airway, that cough <coughs> will help bring it back up and out, swallow it down so you, you don't 
end up choking on it because it, it slipped down past your vocal cords into your airway. So now some swallow strengthening exercises, and there are some, and I'll give you one. Uh, they are some tongue strengthening exercises because the tongue is a muscle and it helps control how much and how fast food and liquid come towards the back of your throat. There's some throat strengthening exercises we can do. Sometimes uh, we could recommend something called neuromuscular electrical stimulation um, or NMES. Other words known as vital stim or e-swallow. That's just a brand name, but what it is is we, it helps, it's a machine that helps the, the nerves talk to muscles to tell them to squeeze harder to get stronger. So, oops, let me go backward. So just as a preview, that's kind of what some exercises we can do, and we'll, we can do some together. So there's, for example, for your tongue. Again, it controls um, liquid and food. So one exercise we do is tongue resistance. It's when you press a, one muscle against another structure or another muscle isometric strength exercise. Um, so to make the tongue stronger. So you're kind of wondering, what am I looking at? All right, so that, that wave is actually the tongue. Those two little jagged points are the upper and lower teeth, and the two things that are sticking out in front are the lips. If you can kind of see where you are, that's all pink area. The white is inside the mouth. All right, so for example, one thing that we do to, um, you can use to make your tongue stronger is you just kind of press. You imagine you have like a piece of hard candy Okay, on your tongue. Okay, or if you're sucking on a lollipop. Okay, imagine where it is, and what you're gonna do is just press that lollipop up against the roof of your mouth, and press and hold, and you're gonna hold for a count of five. Okay, and you can kind of feel everything down here getting tight. I don't know if you can, but can you? All right, so these muscles are used for swallowing. So what you're doing is exercising the tongue. And, and sometimes people don't even know you're doing it, or they can know it, that you're doing it. But breathe when you do them, okay, any of these exercises. Other things, now this again is one of those pictures that I took off YouTube or the, the internet. Um, one exercise is called the Masako exercise and it's, it was developed by a doctor named Masako, it's her first name. She's an ENT or an ear, nose, throat doctor. She's in Japan. Um, she developed this exercise and a lot of the speech language pathologists will teach it to their patients or their clients. Um, and it's simple, but it's hard to do, if that makes sense. Simple, but hard. So we're going to do it together. Now, I don't want you to have to touch your tongue. You don't have to. It's just the picture that I found. But we'll do it together just as one of those um, either bar tricks you can do or party tricks. But then also, it's just good for you to kind of keep on top of it when you're, while you're young and while things are still working. So what you're going to do is stick your tongue out of your mouth. Okay, you can pinch on it with your teeth and your lips, but not hard. Okay, so keep it out and swallow at the same time. <laughs> People still trying? <laughs> it's like, yeah, try. okay, so, but even if you couldn't do it, you can kind of feel your throat kind of rev, 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 right? Okay, so that is helping different parts, and I don't want to get too technical about it, but that's kind of a good indicator of how strong your swallow is, because if you can do it, your swallow is pretty strong. Want to try again? Okay, and, the, and once you get it, you get it, and you're able to do it, and the better you get at it, the farther out you stick your tongue. So it's always a challenge. You can always get better at stuff. Okay, but that's another, in a way, it's like an isometric exercise. Depending on who you talk to, some people will say, yeah, it's great. Some people will say, you know what, no. But I think it's a good indicator. Um, and this is that neuromuscular electrical stimulation I was talking about that, if you can see, she's holding in her hand a unit. Um, and it just, it's a very refined type of um, electrical stimulation. Uh, if any of everybody, let me try that again. If any of you have been to physical therapy um, and you've had a TENS unit ever put on your body, um, it's kind of similar, but these are very small, and it's made specifically for swallowing. So we put the electrodes on the throat, um, and it depends. And then you, you put on a, a little bit of stimulation, and those muscles get talked to by the nerves, and you have that on while you eat and while you drink. Um, and that hopefully uh, that it'll help strengthen those muscles that you're using so that they get stronger. So the research on that is based a lot on physical therapy.
research. Now, some tips on safe feeding when caring for others, because that's important. Uh, some of us are caregivers for our older um, elderly parents, and we need to know how to, to feed best. So make sure that you're doing small bites and small sips. What is small? I would say about maybe a level teaspoon at a time, nothing heaping. And sometimes what happens is, oh, he's eating, let's keep going. All right, so or let's heap it because otherwise he's not going to keep eating and he's going to lose interest. Um, but smaller bites are easier for them to handle smaller sips. Feed slowly. Now, sometimes it just takes a while for them to swallow. As we get older, research is showing things slow down um, and they're, they're not as strong as they used to be. So what used to take him or her maybe 20 minutes to eat is going to take a little bit longer now. So you have to be patient. Sit at eye level when you're helping somebody to eat. Because if you stand above, tendency is they'll look up at you like this. All right, and if you're above and you pull the spoon out or the fork out, the head will follow this way. And when we swallow like, okay, everybody try that. Let's swallow this way. Ooh, can you swallow when you're head up? And I don't know why people swallow medication like that. How many of you do that? Don't swallow meds like that. And so well, I try to do it because I got to get my head back to get the pills back. You can do that to get the pills back if you need to. But before you swallow, bring the head forward, okay, and swallow. Or if you need to put the chin slightly downward, okay, nobody's meant to swallow this way. We always swallow most safely when head is in the most neutral, natural position possible, right? We don't swallow like this, okay, we don't. So keep it as natural and neutral as possible. Um, present utensil or cup at chin or lip level again. Watch for the Adam's apple to rise and fall completely before you feed any more. Okay, so put your fingers right here. Can everybody find where your Adam's apple is? That's that little bump, bumpity bump. Now, when you swallow, it's like, we have nothing to swallow. We've swallowed everything. We're all dry now. All right, so you just put your finger here and swallow. You're going to feel your Adam's apple rise up and over that finger. You feel it? No, no, I don't. That's why I need to see you. <laughs> okay, but you got to look for that. Now, it's going to come up and down. It's going to hold. Because sometimes people will trick you, okay? There's some folks that will trick you because it's going to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're thinking they're swallowing, but they're not. They're just kind of pumping, pumping along. And then you'll see this, yeah, yeah. Okay, then you'll know they swallowed. And you're like, what, what, what is that? What am I looking for? It's just, a, it'll come up forward, hang a little bit, and then come back down. You got to look for that to make sure that they've swallowed. Now, if they've got too much stuff around the neck, because sometimes people do, it's hard to tell. So you're just going to have to kind of, you, you can feel if you want to, just kind of judge or just go slowly. All right, and then another thing to do is to listen every so often to the voice. And if you just say, hey, Dad, how are you doing? Or how's the food? Auntie, how is it? Um, if they're like, Okay, if they're all gut, then okay, all right, just have them cough and to just cough and then either spit it out or cough <laughs> and swallow it down because you want to blow it out of the airway, you don't want it dancing around in there. Okay, now the main thing is to make sure you keep your mouth or their mouths, everyone's mouth clean, so the teeth, gum, tongue, everything. Why? Because a lot of germs live there. And what, 50% of the germs in your mouth live on your tongue. All right, so why did I say you need to brush their teeth before the first meal of the day, or you brush your teeth before the first meal of the day, or before your first meds of the day, depending on what you do first? Because your mouth gets really dirty overnight, okay? It just does, because we're not swallowing as much. We make less saliva, germs hang around. Sometimes if we reflux, there's some stuff that could be dancing in the mouth. And if the first thing you do is drink something or eat something, and Heaven forbid, one of that thing, whatever you do, goes down the wrong pipe. You got germs on, down there too now. Not just the water, but now you got germs from your mouth in there. So that, as we talked about mouth care, can cause or, or contribute to a pneumonia or a lung infection in folks that are already quite maybe weak and a little debilitated. So mouth care is important. If you can, take them to the dentist or go, you go to the dentist. If you have insurance, use it. Don't be afraid. Use it because uh, you can save yourself a world of problems if you take good care of your mouth. So your dentist is your best friend because if your mouth stays clean, your heart and your lungs stay clean for a long time and healthy. All right. And I think that's it. We just zipped through everything. 
we have all, hang on, hang on, we got all these references. Mahalo. <laughs> and that's that. All right, thank you, Joanne. And now she's going to take a seat and we're going to open the floor up to questions. If you have some written questions, you can give the cards to myself or James. If you have a question right now, raise your hand. Okay, I see one in the front coming down here. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for sharing that very interesting information. <laughs> I had a um, hard time swallowing about 10 years ago, went to the GI doctor and came up with a cause that was reflux. And so he gave me some pantroprazole, which I've been taking every day, which really holds it down. But lately, the last several months, maybe the better part of this year, uh, when I make myself breakfast to sit down to, to eat it, I, I don't have the appetite to eat it. And, and after a few minutes, I start to get a little uh, nauseous. And, and then I sneeze. I sneeze once, twice, maybe. Mm. And then it's okay. And then I have my appetite. Mm. So what could possibly go, be going on there? Hmm. You got me on that one. Now, you know, that's a, that's a question I think your doctor should answer for you. I'm not sure. But sometimes folks, from my experience, sometimes folks who have history of reflux will start sneezing when they eat because it's, that, it's when the juices start going because you're going to eat. And then you, it just kind of comes up into this whole nasal area sometimes. It just puff, puff. It gets in here and then you, and then you're okay. But that's something you should talk with your doctor about. How often is that happening, and when did that start? For how long? Have you talked to your doctor about that? Okay, you should. Have you lost weight? Okay, you better talk to him about that then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a question here. I, I have no problem in swallowing food and the drinks. Okay, But recently, I have difficulty swallowing tiny little pills. I've tried four or five times with more mm. water to mm. get tiny little pills down. Mm. Why is that? Small, tiny little, small The pills. pesky little tiny ones, yeah. It, it gets stuck in it. Just stuck up here or down here? Uh, well, here, yeah. Right. Do you take a sip of water before you take your pills? You take water first, uh, and then you take pill and water, too? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Sometimes might, what might help, I'm not sure how come that's happening. Is that only now, or it's always been happening? Recent, rec Recently. Recent, recent months. Hmm. Anything changed within the month? You had new medicine, you changed something? No. Yeah, um, that one, what I, can, what I can suggest to help you swallow better, I don't know why it's happening, but um, what you can do is maybe try to, if you can take it with, with food, you can try to take it with food or with applesauce if you need to, or with yogurt or with pudding, that helps. As a second question, sometimes uh, when I'm lying down trying to sleep, I feel mucus in the back of my nose. Mm -hmm. I cannot swallow it. It wouldn't go down. Mm. I have to sit up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you, you spit it out after that? When I sit up, I can, you it can, will go down. It will go, go down, down. But I have to sit up. Yeah. How often does that happen? Oh, several. Uh, I mean, once every some, once every some days, some weeks. Yeah. Not every day, no. That's when you're lying down? Yes. How, how, how late do you eat dinner before you lie down? Oh, two, 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 three hours. Do you have any snack before you go to bed? Oh, no, no, no. No, okay. Uh, how, I, sometimes I ask my people, um, how do you sleep? Are you on your, on your back, on your stomach, or on your side? Oh, on my back. On your back. Do you have a pillow? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes, and sometimes people, um, when you, when people lie down, um, it can be a couple of things, yeah? Sometimes it's, it's, we don't swallow as much when we're laying down sometimes, or when we're sleeping, we don't swallow as much. So sometimes the saliva can collect in here, or sometimes when we're lying down, if we have anything um, 
from the stomach uh, that can come back up a little bit. That can irritate inside your throat too. So that could also um, make phlegm, you said, yeah, in your throat. Joanne. When, when you cough, what color is it? Or, when, or you don't bring no, it out, yeah? No, you don't bring don't, it out, you just, just swallow. It goes down, yeah. I don't have to spit it out. Yeah. I'm in bed. It only happens when I'm lying down. Okay, so it has something to do with your position then, yeah? <laughs> Maybe. Thank you, thank you. Joanne, Joanne, do you mind if I address that Oh, yeah, that Kim, question? please, please Hi, jump in. Hi, I'm, I'm Kim. I'm one of the inpatient speech pathologists. In response to your report about small things getting stuck, tiny pills, do you ever find what rice gets stuck? Small food, art, smooth, does small food particles get stuck too? Oh no, just the, the pills. pills. Okay. Yeah. We all, all of us, have, it's just through our anatomy, we have pockets in our throat or in our pharynx, yeah? So, but each of us is a little different in that the depths of those pockets are a little different. So some people have deeper pockets, some people have more shallower pockets. When you have really deep pockets, and you won't know this unless you're scoped by an ear, nose, and throat doctor or unless you undergo one of those fee studies, um, some of us, me included, have very deep pockets. So small pills are the dickens. They get right in that pocket and you have a really hard time getting it out. So Joanne's suggestion with taking the pills, especially applesauce or pudding or yogurt, will kind of help wash that through and kind of bypass that. Um, the other thing that actually hurt, helps me personally is for sure when you're, drink, when you're taking your pills, make sure you kind of tuck your chin, chin. down a little bit mm -hmm. when you're swallowing. That might help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture today. It was very enlightening. I want you to ask if you noticed in your years of training, if you noticed any uh, correlation between um, changes in speech or language when people who have trouble swallowing? It, it depends. Sometimes, you know, if you have, for example, like a stroke or something, because there's some weakness on one side or depending, then you can have some trouble with your swallowing too. So your speech gets maybe more slurred because there's weakness all the way down one side. Is, is that good? Or, 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 or yeah, also, I was wondering, because I was wondering if there was any kind of correlation between the way one swallows and then the native language one speaks. Or I don't know if those two were related. I, I guess... I guess maybe I'm overthinking it. <laughs> maybe. Well, so you're asking if there's a relationship somehow mm -hmm. between how we swallow mm -hmm. and and the way we speak. The way we speak, meaning like if we have an accent or the accent, or, yeah, accent, native language, native language, the way one's mouth orientation is when they speak affects the way we swallow. Not, not in my experience. Kim, have you noticed anything like that? Yeah. Because structurally, I think we're all the same all around the world. We're all the same structurally. Okay. Uh, yes, I was wondering if the way one speaks or the native language would uh, have any correlation with the way one swallows, if it affects it in any way, or if when one has trouble swallowing, does it affect one's speech and language? Um, They're connected at all. A particular language doesn't have any correlation with swallowing. Yeah. Um, if you're referring to if a person had a stroke or some kind of a neurological involvement, if it, if it affects their ability to communicate, then yeah, that will affect whatever language they speak, whether it be English or a different language. Is that your question? <laughs> yeah. But it's not necessarily, it's not correlated to swallowing. Kim, if, uh, this is Kim, That's and Kim. she is an uh, inpatient speech-language pathologist. Could I have you take the stage, too? Yeah. Okay. You know, because then it's recorded, otherwise they might not hear the answer. Oh, gotcha. And so you can both answer. And I have a question here. Yes, I'd like to know if, as you get older, does your throat get narrower? So it makes it harder to swallow? If when you're older, does your throat get narrow? It, it can, in, in a way, because everything kind of shrinks as we get older, you know, and gets a little less uh, strong, too. So we lose, I think, collagen, you know, so sometimes things get a little bit, yeah, it could be smaller and tighter or less 
the, we have what we call muscular contractions. The muscle squeezes and pushes the food through the food pipe, through the esophagus. Sometimes we get older, that doesn't squeeze as hard. Yeah, so food kind of gets stuck. Or mm -hmm. just takes a little bit of time for it to go down. So you're like, I feel something stuck here. I know it's here, it's here. Or it's like, let, pound me. I'm going to pound myself here for a little bit and it'll go down. So sometimes that is just a little slow going down. Or, to, or sometimes it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then it decides to go down. And so once all this part clears out, it's just... Whew, I feel better now up here. Okay, thank you. We have a question there. Um, I just wanted to know if swallowing is impacted by vocal cord paralysis. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it can be um, because the vocal cords are inside the, the, the windpipe. Right, so the vocal cords actually look like this. We have them on, uh, well, okay, they, they, they look like this. They open and close, open and close, and they protect your windpipe. That's their main reason for being there, to give you your cough. They also give you your voice, that's secondary, and then they like, just sing kato, okay, that's like the third thing. <laughs> so now, vocal cords normally open, shut, open, shut. So if you have a vocal cord that doesn't play well with the other one, okay, so now you always have a space that's open. So the way we're made, it's very interesting. So we have, in a way, it's like we have a belt and suspenders. That's how we're put together. So vocal cords will close. Trap door, which is your epiglottis, will cover over. Okay, so it kind of closes and does that. Okay, then after you swallow, everything opens up. So heaven forbid that trap door doesn't close if you have any kind of vocal cord weakness because now your vocal cords aren't quite closing up altogether either. So now you've got something maybe a little bit open. you got the... Vocal cords a little open, things can leak inside. So it can be, it can be a problem at times. It doesn't always have to be, especially if hopefully if you're doing a strong swallow, get, get that, that trap door down nice and tight, shut it off, and then sometimes you might have to do that swallow strong cough and then swallow again so that in case anything leaked in there and snuck in there, you blow it up and out and swallow it down. So all along, our swallowing mechanism is all basically is pressures, yeah? Pressures and valves, pressures and valves, yeah? Your mouth starts as a, as a valve, basically. Your tongue helps with the pumping, and then that creates the pressure to kind of help propel the food, the liquid, down through your throat. Then the muscles contract. Those are pressures that then squeeze, yeah? And so the vocal cords are the mechanical piece of protecting our airway when we swallow. Yeah. Yeah. For the vocal cords? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are different approaches. And so the one one was that the neuromuscular electrical stimulation. There's other stuff that's like high intensity, like swallowing training. It's almost like physical training for your throat. It's like swallow, 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 swallows different stuff and big stuff and all of that. So, you know, so there's that kind of a program as well to strengthen just the muscles. Okay, thank you. We have a question here. Can you share with us um, a few exercises for um, the discoordination of swallowing and breathing? Oh, that's an interesting question. Wouldn't you bring that one up? <laughs> okay, so normally the normal swallow or the, the normal, the coordination of breathing and swallowing is, okay, so we breathe in. Okay, so if we're at rest, we breathe in. We breathe out. We breathe in. We breathe out. Okay, it's, it's regular. Okay, so normally, okay, so now the, the swallowing pattern, breathing swallowing pattern is we breathe in, we release a little bit, hold the breath, ooh, swallow, ah, exhale. Okay, breathe in, ex re release a little bit of air, ooh, swallow. Ah, okay, so the thing is when you swallow, you got to make sure you have some air in your lungs. It's just the way we're made because just in case something slides down the wrong pipe, you should be able to blow it up and out, okay? So you shouldn't be swallowing, okay, don't do that because you're going to vacuum it right down the windpipe, okay? So just make sure you have enough air in your lungs before you swallow and then hold your breath. And then. It, depending, it depends on what's causing the discoordination, mm -hmm. okay? So for example, if you had like a stroke, because sometimes that can cause some real discoordination and that's a neurological thing and you really maybe necessarily can't train that, but you can train awareness of, okay, I got to breathe. It's like, you know, like when you jump rope, you kind of, well, I don't know, if you ever had to jump rope, you kind of wait and then you jump in, okay? You got to time it. So sometimes it's just being aware of the timing and then, okay, I'll go hold my breath and then I'll swallow and, and then you can try. 
I would try maybe if you're going to really try to coordinate it, you can maybe try with something a little bit easier to control like applesauce because then it moves more slowly. Because if you try it with water and you miss it, it's really hard. In the hospital setting, we do see that a lot in coordination of respiration or breathing with swallowing, particularly with our patients who have been intubated or on a vent, yeah? patients who have a tracheostomy tube, and so that there's a lot of times there's that discoordination. A lot of times we take that for granted, so people think that, oh, but he's, he's being managed on the vent, he's doing just fine breathing-wise. Yes, but that coordination of inhalation, stop breathing, swallow, exhalation is gone. And so oftentimes that's what the concern is for our patients in the hospital when they have needs to be on a, a respirator. Well, I was wondering in the um, very elderly, is it common um, for them to lose their ability to swallow and therefore cannot eat enough and um, they don't want artificial feeding, so um, it's, is there anything that can be done? You want me to address that one? You can, and then I'll jump in after. We, we get that a lot in the hospital setting in particular. Um, our patients are living longer, thank goodness, to um, medical care. May or may not always be a positive thing, however, um, what we do stress is make sure you make your needs known, number one, as to what you would like. It's called an advanced health care directive. If your wishes are in a situation where you're not going to be able to make that decision, then your advanced health care directive comes into play. A lot of times, yes, people do not want to have artificial means of nutrition. We respect that. And so then the discussion becomes one of what's called palliative care. Our role as a speech pathologist in that situation is we are asked to come in, evaluate the swallowing, determine the safety or not, or what risk the person is at for aspirating food, liquid going into the lungs, and we make our assessment, we make our recommendations, we have a discussion with the family, the patient, the doctors, um, and if it truly is at the point where we're going we're gonna to enact their advanced health care directive, then the discussion does need to move towards what's called palliative care or comfort feeding. Yeah. So you ask if people stop swallowing at times. It depends, you know, as, as Kim was saying too, or sometimes people who have dementia, as they get towards the end, or it gets more severe, they just don't swallow. Sometimes they just, it just doesn't hook up anymore. Sometimes they don't, they're not hungry, um, or they just, they just, just stop doing things. It, it, they just kind of slowly go away. Um, there are some folks who are quite lucid. They they know what they want, but they just you know they just don't have an appetite. Sometimes people want to eat, but they just can't. You know, or they get too tired. Because swallowing is a lot of work. It's like a lot of explosive movements over a long period of time. So if you think about swallowing, it's like if you kind of like we did some swallowing exercises. You can feel your Adam's apple go up, down, up, down. That's like doing jumping jacks. Okay, it's like doing a jumping jack. But try to do that for 30 minutes. Or in Hawaii, we eat in 10. So just kind of imagine going like the jumping jacks for like 10 minutes straight. That's a lot of work. Now when you're 80 something, 90 something, sometimes 60 something, it's a lot of work. And I, I'd, I, I can't, I'm just too tired. Or I, I'll eat a little bit and I still want to anymore. Okay, so sometimes that's also, fatigue is an issue. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Could you give us any recommendations about patients with Sjogren's disease uh, where dry mouth sometimes makes it difficult to swallow? Yeah, that's one. How much water are the Sjogren's people drinking? And is there, you know, there's different things. You've got to drink a lot of water. Water sips throughout the day is a good thing just to kind of keep things hydrated. Um, there are different things that you can use, like um, the biotin mist. I don't know if you've seen that. Everybody's seen that. They have something called Aura Moist Patch. You can put that in your mouth, um, and it'll stick in there. It's supposed to help generate some saliva, and you can have that on while you eat um, and drink. It stays in place, so you, you put it, depending on what, your, what time of day, it's supposed to um, stay through meals. So it can stay, and stop, stay stuck inside your mouth for about four hours at a shot. Anything else? Nope. Yeah. Okay, we have a question there. Can, can I? Uh, can you mention something about 
swallowing and coughing. What, what goes on there? Swallowing and coughing yeah, or coffee? Say, say you're eating and swallowing and then you cough. Uh-huh. Is there something violent going on? Or is eating. Is like food trying to come in and go out? Or is it preventing something going to the lungs? What, what's, mm -hmm. what's happening there? That? That yeah. somehow you're, it's, coughing is a reflex. So what, what, what should one do when that? Cough. Happens? Cough. Don't suppress cough. And cough with your mouth open. It's okay. Okay? Because a lot of times I see people cough. <laughs> okay? That's not effective. You need your mouth open because <coughs> you got to blow it up and out. Okay? It's not a bad thing to cough. I mean, it kind of is because I mean something's getting where it shouldn't, but it's a good thing to cough because that means you're protected. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. When I was uh, younger, I had a friend who would drink an entire glass of water and then just hold his neck up like this and spill it down his airway and it would go down without swallowing. I always envy that guy because I, I, don't, I can't do that. And it's getting worse as I get older. So I'm wondering, is there a way to train yourself to do that? Is that possible? No swallowing. I didn't yeah. see his animal apples move at all. It's just like an open pipe and water just flowed right down. The entire bottle of coconut right down. He's also a sword swallower in the circus, right? <laughs> you didn't mention that. <laughs> That's an interesting role model. <laughs> is, is that possible? Can, can we get trained to do that? Or I don't, you know, don't know you, anything yeah. about that? That's, I, yeah, that's an interesting thing because that's like a up, that's called the upper esophageal sphincter. What's that? It's a valve here in your throat. Then you have a valve in your throat above in your throat, and you have a valve above your stomach. And they're meant to move in one direction to keep everything from backing up. So. For some reason, he's able to kind of open that up by himself. The thing is, you don't want to do that because you don't want anything else backflowing, you know? Cause yeah, so the question is, why would you want to do that? Yeah, that that's <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you drink water? Oh, well, then you know what? My, my information's not there. <laughs> But it depends, too, how fast you're drinking. A lot of times, as we get older, we can't do things as we used to. Not that we're old, but I don't skip anymore, you know. Cause I just don't. So same thing. Yeah. You know, you may not chug, chug. chug. Don't do that. In, in, you know, no. Mm -hmm. That's my dad. Dick Kim, why do I choke when I drink? Well, show me how you drink, Dad. Yeah. Okay, well, don't drink like that. <laughs> yeah, it worked before. Yeah, it did. But, you know, we used to hang upside down from trees before. I don't do that anymore. So <laughs> I would suggest you don't either. Yeah. No scoldings. No scoldings. Just love. <laughs> no judgments. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great question to end the, uh, the evening with. Thank you. Uh, let's give a round of applause for Joanne Kawahigashi Oshiro and King Mabwa. So Kim Magua is an inpatient speech language pathologist at the Queen's Medical Center, and she was out there uh, helping with the information table, so you got to talk with her outside, but then we were lucky to have her come join us yeah. on the Q&A panel, so thank you, Kim, and let's give her a round of applause, too. I also want to say thank you to our two volunteers this evening, Lon Nguyen and James Liu. Let's give them a round of applause. James, James is with, uh, he's, uh, he hasn't even graduated yet, so he's going to mid-pack, and what I got to say about him is, you know, even throughout the school year, he chooses to spend his school nights on Wednesdays, like, with us to help us, so, like, teens today, I mean, really, awesome, right? Nice. <laughs> uh, also, our next Speaking of Health lecture is on chronic kidney disease, and the numbers are pretty phenomenal. They say that uh, 30 million American adults have it. And if you're like, whoo, it's not me, I'm not the 30 million, and millions of others are at risk. It's that at risk. Uh, and if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, if you have poor circulation, if you have family members who have kidney disease, then you are at risk. And it is a silent, progressive disease, and it can lead to the loss of kidney function. We're going to have two uh, doctors speaking next month, Dr. Amuda Palani Sami, who is a transplant nephrologist, and also transplant surgeon Dr. Makoto Ogihara. They're going to talk about what is chronic kidney disease, what are the signs, what are the symptoms, how can you decrease your risk, what are the treatment options, and they're also going to talk about dialysis and kidney transplants. We're also going to have with us special guests who are kidney 
uh, transplant recipients. So they had living kidney donors who agreed to donate one of their kidneys to them, and you'll hear their journey and their experience. Uh, so that's going to be Wednesday, August 29th, 2018. 5.30 to 7 p.m. right here at the Queen's Conference Center. If you want to register for that, register for that you can go to queens.org and click on classes and events, or just call our Queens referral line, 691-7117. That is going to do it for us this evening. I want to thank you all for coming. Don't forget to get your parking validated with Aaron out in the lobby. Our guests are going to be speaking in the lobby. If you have additional questions, have a great evening and drive safe. Good night.